The podcast you're about to listen to discusses content of serious nature, including descriptions of racial oppression and violence, which may be upsetting to some listeners. Please proceed with care. Beginning in the middle of the 17th century, European colonists established a brutal slave society at the southwestern tip of Africa that lasted for more than 150 years. The legacy of this period has affected the development of South Africa ever since, and it can still be felt today. This is A History of Slavery at the Cape. Part 2. The Work of Enslaved People In 1910, the formerly enslaved Katie Jacobs told a newspaper journalist, The work was more arduous than an old farm, for the land had never been cultivated, and was overgrown with innumerable big bushes. For the first year, I had to take my pick and shovel and fall in regularly with the men at sunrise to clear the land. In the evening, I assisted in the kitchen. At other times of the year, I herded cattle. Enslaved people formed the backbone of the Cape economy, especially in Cape Town itself, and on the grain and wine farms around Cape Town. By 1693, enslaved people at the Cape outnumbered free people for the first time. By 1770, there were 2,523 privately owned enslaved people in the colony. In 1745, a scene has showed up roughly equal numbers of enslaved people and settlers, about 6,000. Slavery at the Cape was initially an urban phenomenon. The VOC brought enslaved people to the Cape for its own use to develop Cape Town physically and administratively as the center of the colony. The slave lodge was built by enslaved labor in the center of the settlement in 1679, making it the second oldest still existing colonial structure of the Cape Colony after the Castle of Good Hope. The building was used to house and save people owned by the VOC in 1811. Today, it's a museum managed by Ezekiel Museums of South Africa. It is estimated that a total of between 7,000 and 9,000 enslaved people lived in the Slayer Lodge over a period of 132 years. It was the largest slave holding at Cape Town throughout the period of slavery. Life was not easy in the Slave Lodge. The Dutch East India Company controlled every aspect of enslaved people's lives there. Life in the Slave Lodge was unhealthy. It was wet, dark, and dirty. An underground stream flows below the building and it is regularly flooded the cellar during winter. The roof leaked, leading to further hardship in the wet winter months. The enslaved inmates only received blankets after 1685. Before then, they had nothing to cover themselves with against the cold. By the late 17th century, the Cape Colony began to expand and a small but displaced 
free settler society was established, supplying Cape Town with produce in very early years. This expansion was modest. The few white farmers who arrived at Cape Town settled down in the immediate surroundings of Cape Town. The number of settlers continued to increase. By 1690, Europeans had taken control of almost all the land in southern West Cape. As the expansion continued, the number of enslaved people brought to the colony steadily increased throughout the 18th century. According to Otto Frendich Mentelzol, a Parisian visitor to the Cape in 1730s, the expansion of the colony demands an ever-increasing number of slaves. Every farmer requires many more slaves than members of his own household to grow his crops and develop his land. Slaveholding was widespread in the Cape and even poor settlers in the interior often owned enslaved people. By 18,000, approximately 90% of all settlers owned enslaved people. As the slave society grew, a class of very wealthy farmers developed on profits derived from labor of enslaved people. Cape Town, the only harbor of the colony, was home to most of the population. During the first half of the 18th century, between 60 and 85 ships visited the port every year. The local economy was dedicated to serving the needs of these ships and the lives of the white settlers. Cape Town merchants spent a living by buying produce including wheat, white and meat, as well as byproducts such as tallow, leather, soap and candles from the farms in the countryside cheaply, and selling it at a higher price to sailors on the passing ships. they would buy goods from the ships and sell them to the inhabitants of the colony at an increased price. Outside of Cape Town, but within 100 kilometers of it, were numerous grain, wine and fruit farms that supply produce to its markets. Further inland, beyond the mountains of the Cape Fold Belt, large stock farms bred cattle and sheep that would be driven to the market in Cape Town periodically. These distant cattle and sheep farms employ comparatively few formerly enslaved people, relying instead on indigenous koi and sun laborers. The wine, grain and fruit farms, in contrast, used enslaved people extensively, putting them to heavy manual work, including plowing, digging, pruning, reaping and gathering and pressing grapes. One well-known example of the prosperous farm built on enslaved labour is the beautiful Jura Constantia wine estate. In 1685, the farm Constantia, part of which later became Jura Constantia, was given to Simon van der Stahl, the commander of the Cape Colony by the Dutch East India Company, and it later changed ownership many times. For some 150 years, the farm made extensive use of the labour of enslaved men, women and children some of whom were born at the Cape and others who came from India and Madagascar, Bali, Cape Verde, Brazil, the Canary Islands, Ceylon and Batavia. They worked throughout the year, picking grapes, weeding, treading grapes, cleaning and preparing wine casks. Enslaved people who worked at the farmhouse did domestic work and worked in the vegetable gardens. By the early 19th century, there were also enslavers who admitted that the primary purpose of some of their farms was the breeding of slaves, as any child born to an enslaved woman they owned would become their property and valuable financial asset. We must remember not to ignore the role played by indigenous San and Khoi men and women in the economy of the Cape. While the European settlers were not legally permitted to enslave them, they were extensively incorporated into the labour force of the colony. Every single day, 
enslaved people and Koi and San servants and laborers worked, bought, ate and lived together. The work on the farms of the colony was done by enslaved people and indigenous San and Koi laborers. As the European settlers forced the Koi and San off their ancestral land, tension, social conflict and even minor warfare were common between them in the 17th and 18th centuries. As they were stripped of their livestock and land and denied access to grazing and water resources, they were increasingly forced to work for the settlers. By 1806, Koyan San laborers made up about 30% of the total labor force in the Stellenbosch and Darkenstein districts. More than half of the farmers there are Koi and San workers as well as enslaved people. The VOC also employed many San and Koi laborers. The economy of Cape Town itself depended heavily on the work of enslaved people. Many enslavers lived as rentiers, hiring out the enslaved people that they owned to others, including building contractors, or simply just by sending them out into the streets with goods, demanding that they bring back a certain sum of money each week. The enslaved people who were owned by the VOC worked in various ways to build, manage, and protect the growing settlement as manual laborers and skilled artisans. They worked in the company's gardens, in quarries, in the docks loading and unloading ships, as woodcutters, fishers, bakers, masons, smiths, coopers, brickmakers, and carpenters. The main function of the enslaved people who were owned by the city's white settlers was domestic labor. They cooked, did needlework, cleaned homes, collected firewood, and fetched water from the water pumps. There was no tap water or electricity in those days. Domestic work took up a lot of time. The houses had to be cleaned, a big task in an era of dirt roads and coal ovens. Washing had to be done by hand. Foods such as fruit, vegetables and meat had to be preserved as there were neither deep freezers nor refrigerators. All meals had to be prepared from scratch. Although the average Cape Town enslaver owned fewer than six enslaved people, some affluent families employed a small army of gardeners, carriers, grooms, coachmen, cooks, housemaids, nursery maids, wet nurses and laundry maids to see to all of their needs. Many privately owned enslaved people were hired up to do unskilled work such as working in the docks. of midwife, wet nurse and nanny in private households would typically all be performed by a single enslaved woman. Katie Jacobs worked as a wet nurse on her enslaver's farm. I was a healthy woman and as my missus was in rather delicate health I became foster mother to her firstborn son and here. During this time, I was well looked after and became one of the family. That is, I was made to sleep on the floor of the dining room near the bedroom door to be at hand when the young boss wanted another drink of milk. Although they may not be publicly acknowledged, the expertise of women like Katie Jacobs were central to the survival of settlers' families and, therefore, the entire settler community.
Some of the Cape Swines and Graham's farmers eventually amassed large estates and became the wealthiest members and principal enslavers of the colony. On the big wealthy farms, enslaved people lived in slave quarters. On most farms, however, enslaved people slept in kitchens, attics and barns or outdoors when the weather was warm. Enslaved people who did domestic work, especially the women, usually slept in their main house, sometimes in the kitchen but also sometimes in the same room as their enslavers. For 165 years, there were no rules about how enslaved people should be fed. Only in 1823 did the government declare that enslaved people is to be daily supplied with sufficient and wholesome food. Thereafter, enslaved people were supposed to receive a pound of meat, half a pound of rice, and half a pound of bread per day. A few wealthy Cape Town enslavers dressed their enslaved people in uniforms. However, most enslaved people had very basic clothing. Clothing was used to distinguish enslaved people from free people. Enslaved men were not allowed to wear shoes, which placed them in the same status category as underage children of free people who usually used to walk barefoot. Enslaved people were also not allowed to wear hats until they passed an exam to prove they could speak Dutch. Some enslaved men undermined this rule by wearing handkerchiefs and turbans. Some enslaved men were set free or manumitted while the practice of slavery continued. Some were set free as a reward of hard work. Some who were allowed to earn money could save enough to buy their own freedom. In a few cases, the partner of an enslaved woman brought her freedom in order to marry her. In other instances, the enslaved person's purchase price was paid by a family member who had already obtained their freedom. However, money motion was rare at the Cape. Only about 14 enslaved people were freed each year during the 18th century. There were few job opportunities for enslaved people who gained their freedom outside of Cape Town. Most enslaved people who were freed did not gain full citizenship rights. These formerly enslaved people were called free blacks. As time went on, they were treated less like Dutch colonists and more like Goy and San people. For instance, they had to carry passes when they moved about. at the Cape was created by us, a group of grades 6 and 7 students at Cedar House Prep School in Cape Town in 2020. We are Hannah, Angel, Mella, <laughs> Candy, Sam, Danica, Ayala, Jamie, Deadone, Kit, Bella, Catherine, James, Ollie, and Mac.